I said in the, in the introduction, um, this workshop um, um, stems in part from the work that we've been doing at Portus, and this is very much a journey that we're on at the moment, and one in which you know, a number of the people in, the, in this room are helping us out on, particularly we're open, as I'll come on to a bit later. Um, first off, what the, this place is, where I've been working for a very long time. This is the director of the site, it's called Simon Kay, and this is the uh, the press association shot, um, you know, the publicity shot taken underneath the Imperial Palace at Portus. So it was a, an enormous Roman complex that we've been excavating for for about 15 years now. Um, just to orientate yourself, um, the big black blob in the top left is Rome, and we're a little bit, you know, not far away from Rome. And it was the major route that effectively supported the uh, the, the populace of, of Rome, particularly in the first, second, and and third centuries, and there you've got a little map showing how it was in the first century AD with this enormous um, uh, harbour. Uh, there's lots of old stuff there, you know, as you'd expect, and the old stuff is quite beautiful um, in, in places, and we've also used loads of technologies. So all the different kinds of technologies you can throw at cultural heritage we have. Um, so just two examples here, so in the top left, reflecting this transformation, imaging, so this is a dome um, invented by a PhD student, former PhD student, Lena Katula, now, now at Yale, um, continuing her studies on this. And then on the bottom right, some laser scanning um, being, being done by James Mars, a recently finished PhD student. Um, and I say we've been experimenting with lots of different kinds of technology to capture and to analyse and to present the site. Um, that also includes various weird and wonderful ways of recording, so various head-mounted um, activities, working including uh, with, with, uh, with Martin, who's, who's here at the front. Um, and a lot of um, work trying to disseminate the, the, product to a, the project to a wide audience, so a couple of, um, of documentaries. And what we've become interested in is how you can link together all of these various um, sets of information in order to create a, an open scholarship spectrum, an openly accessible journey from your interest first being piqued perhaps by, by the documentaries, which have had many tens of millions of people watching them, and how you can mm -hmm. then go on a journey and become a researcher um, um, in your own right, wherever you, you happen to be. And we've been working for, for a while trying to support these kinds of, um, th this journey. So one of, the, one of the projects we've done was with Microsoft Research, where we've looked, in this case, at something called rich interactive narratives, so ways of weaving together multimedia data sets and linking those through to publications, through to papers. So you can go from the paper to the data, and there's a story that's told in order to help you understand that relationship. Um, but the main thing that we have, we've been trying um, to link all of these bits together is um, via FutureLearn, this, this course, the Archaeology of Quarters course. I think we're now on to our fifth run, I can't remember, um, and we've had about 25,000 people through it um, from, I think, 160 countries. Um, and those are all big numbers, and, and the big numbers are nice, but as has already been raised in one of the earlier questions, the key thing to think about is who are doing these courses, who has access to them, who has access to them in terms of the ability to use the platforms, who has access to them in terms of the ability to download associated data, who can process the data that we might, might be um, publicising, um, who has the particular skills for which these platforms are tailored. So an example being communicating in short form, writing very pithily and engagingly, being able to capitalise on the social capital of social networks. So all of these things become interesting as soon as you start getting excited by courses. And again, this is the other thing I think that stimulated this workshop. We've been on a journey where we've become really fascinated by how we can share what we've been doing at Portus, and then we're taking a step back and thinking, well, actually, who has access? And what do we need to do in order to facilitate better access? Um, in terms of how the Future Learn course fits into other work, um, I think we've now done about 50 course runs at the University of Southampton. Well over 500,000 um, people have, have, have gone through the various courses we've run, and we've looked at how the learners interact across those courses. And we've also looked at how those learners interact across other courses. So, um, for example, the Hadrian's Wall course, um, run by Ian Haynes, who's here. We've made um, um, bi-directional, um, uh, well, reciprocal links between their course and our course. We've also made links to courses hosted by Coursera <coughs> and on other platforms. So trying to, I guess, break the silos of course delivery um, and encourage learners who might not necessarily <coughs> want to follow a single course, they might want to pursue their own specific um, interests. Um, 
just to, to kind of reassure, I guess, what, what Isabel said, I mean, what's fascinating is the engagement that the, the learners have with these, these platforms. So in this case, we, we asked people to imagine themselves arriving at the port. The kinds of responses we got were um, extraordinary, um, emotive, very um, personal in many cases, very descriptive, multi-sensory, um, and extraordinary. I think we have probably the best um, current understanding of the public uh, perception of the Roman world, at least from our demographic, purely through this one question, in terms of um, sensory experiences and, and imagination. It's a, a wonderful resource. And what we also think is that it's a wonderful resource for doing this, which is what we're all supposed to be doing, which is being research-informed teachers. So, for example, we've linked PhD theses to, to the course, we've linked um, the raw data and tools for processing them, like geophysics or, or some of the geochemical um, uh, work, geoarchaeological, um, linked through to um, published articles and, and so on and so forth. Um, just taking the PhD thesis, there was one, the PhD thesis by Pina Franco, I think had been downloaded something like three times before we did the course. Um, after the first course run, it had been downloaded more than 120 times in the first week. And we know that the people were reading the PhD thesis because of the comments that they were responding, they were responding with. Um, so this is a whole new audience. Um, I've already said that there, there are problems that we need to consider in terms of who genuinely has access to these resources. Um, another thing that's you know, present in many of our minds in higher education at the moment is this, or reflections on this, so the idea of unbundling um, is what's happening, what's already happened to the music industry, currently happening to higher education, and what are the implications of that for us. Um, if you haven't already, I urge you to, to read that with a, with a critical eye, but I urge you to, to read that particular report. And I'd also urge you to look at some of the other emerging critiques of this this process of, of unbundling. So for example, this one, the um, public university, the excellent LSE impact blog, which is critiqued it as, as well. Um, Times Higher, this article about the, the, to what extent learners really are in, more engaged in different forms of, of online learning. Um, and some other prominent critiques like this, where one of the very early pioneers of, uh, of, of the, the, the MOOC model decided that he wanted to withdraw from it because of um, his fears that he would end up um, reducing the job prospects of, of, uh, of colleagues at other institutions. Um, and we, and then uh, I guess another example of the way in which this is um, interesting for us is the fact that not only FutureLearn but other platforms are starting to offer courses um, currently hosted by a single university but offering courses for credit full degrees, um, which may well be leading to what here is described as degreed the jailbreaking of, of the degree. Um, I won't go on because I've, I've got to eight minutes, but um, we've been looking in depth over the last few years, particularly with um, We Are Open, about ways of transforming our practice. And I hope that over the, the coming days, um, that we'll be able to share a bit more about that and we'll be able to learn from, from all of you about how to go on this journey a little bit further. Thank you very much. Yeah.